Today's lecture we're gonna learn about forging. In this chapter we're gonna learn about fundamentals of forging and open die forging operations uh, followed by impression die forging and closed die forging operations and other various forging operations such as such as heading, piercing, coining and we're gonna look at forging defects and die failures and later we're gonna see uh, important points in die design and die materials and lubricants that are used in forging operations As I always say, please don't forget to watch the videos I'm sending you because after you listen to the lecture, I suggest you guys actually watch the videos and read the notes and maybe uh, watch the lecture again. This way it can stay in your mind more clearly. Okay, so what is forging? It is basically a process in which the workpiece is shaped by compressive forces applied through various dies or other tooling. It is one of the oldest uh, metal metal working operation, right? We by hammering the metal with some tools made of stone. People were making jewelry, coins, and other implements. Unlike rolling operations where we produce continuous plates, sheets, and strips uh, with various cross sections, in forging operations we produce discrete parts. And forged parts have good strength and toughness. This is due to the grain structure that is achieved with the forging. And forging operations can be performed uh, with a heavy hammer and most forging operations use uh, a sort of dies and equipment such as presses or powered hammers. Forging uh, may be carried out at room temperature, that's when we call cold forging, or it can be done at elevated temperatures, warm or hot uh, forging. Of course you can understand that in cold forging, um, go here then come back in cold forging it requires higher forces because uh, the ductility is low uh, at room temperature at cold temperatures right so that's why more forces more uh, stronger forces are required to actually hammer the part but this provides good surface finish and dimensional accuracy uh, compared to hot forging. Because in hot forging, of course, it will require lower forces because with the heat, the material is more ductile. So it will look, require lower forces to shape the part. Uh, however, uh, the dimensional accuracy and surface finish of the part is not good because if you watch the videos that I'm sending you if you see the hot forging uh, always there is this oxide scale that is forming while we are trying to actually hammer the part we are doing forging uh, the oxide layers keep forming and of course this oxide layers because of the heat uh, is providing a, another good surface finish to the part. So this is the difference between 
uh, cold and hot forging because the surface finish is not good in hot forging it might require to actually uh, do subsequent finishing operations uh, to correct the part surface for example you can do heat treatment uh, to modify the properties and you can do machining to achieve a better surface finish so here at image a we are seeing the steps involved in forging a knife and as you can see it step by step uh, for, with forging the knife is formed we're gonna see all those sta stages and then in image B we are seeing a landing gear components made by forging you can see a very um, big parts can be shaped by forging and image C you are seeing the equipment the hydraulic press that does the forging So, three different process and its effect on grain flow. So each of these processed casting, machining and forging, these have their own advantages and limitations, of course, regarding the characteristics and properties of the materials, dimensional accuracy, surface finish, etc. And here it is comparing the grain flow. And you see in cast structure we have more uh, coarse uh, grains. And in machine the grain flow is not, the grains are all aligned in one direction, which when there is a cut it exposes the grains to the surface. And in the forged ones, they are they the it, the grains are aligned in the direction of flow and this type of structure basically creates a st more stronger parts this table summarizes different type of forging processes that we're going to learn about like open die forging, closed die forging, precision forging, etc. And their advantages and limitations are summarized here. And let's now look at uh, these uh, processes in more detail. So the first one is open die forging. Open die forging is the simplest forging operation and generally uh, forgings generally weigh from 15 to 500 kilogram and parts can be very small like pins, screws, nails and they can also be very big um, like long shafts so in simple form, we can explain open die forging as a metal uh, workpiece. We call this blank, which is placed in between two flat dies. And basically, its height is reduced by compressing it. This operation is also called upsetting or flat die forging. Well, the die surfaces may have uh, cavities or features that make relatively simple forgings. If you remember the compression tests that uh, being done, there was an effect we called barreling. It was because of the friction between uh, the die and uh, your workpiece. Because the friction between uh, the, their surfaces exist, the material cannot flow freely. And barreling, uh, or what we call pancaking, was observed. So, 
this is let me show you the image first to understand this so if you look at image a if we have two flat dies in open forging and we are upsetting the billet or the work piece uh, if there is no friction it is gonna be a uniform deformation and remember the volume has to stay the same so if there is any reduction in height you of course expect the diameter to increase because the volume should be the same throughout and as you can see if there is no friction then the workpiece is formed deformed uniformly when there is friction between the die and the workpiece then basically it, the part develops a barrel shape as you see in image C because we said this is also called pancaking this this is due to material cannot flow freely uh, at the interaction interacting surfaces and we have seen this effect also in compression testing so this can be minimized if you use a lubricant or also if you heat the dye uh, that is also going to reduce this friction the reason is you are trying to upset the hot work piece in between cold dyes and when the work piece comes in contact with the dye surface it cools rapidly while the bulk remains hot and therefore it flows more easily compared to the uh, surfaces therefore it will also result in barreling therefore uh, increasing the temperature of the dyes is helping with the barreling okay so i'm trying to say it also helps uh, with preventing the formation of barreling if you actually increase the temperature of the dyes okay so Hogging or drawing out this is an open die forging operation in which the thickness of the bar is reduced by successive forging steps so this is as you see in the images the thickness of bars and rings can be reduced by uh, open die forging techniques here you see an illustration of a cogging operation on a rectangular bar that reduces the thickness of the bar and in B you see uh, the diameter of a bar is reduced by the open die forging process and then in C we are seeing the thickness of a ring being reduced by open die forging uh, operation here you can see that the contact area between the die and the workpiece is smaller so remember the pressure is force over area right so if you reduce the contact area it will require less forces to achieve a reduction in thicknesses Another type of forging is impression die forging. Here the workpiece takes the shape of the die cavity while being forged between two shaped dies. So in the previous one we had flat dies. In this one the dies are shaped. So the workpiece takes the shape of that die cavity. So the process is usually carried out at lower temperatures because this will reduce the forging forces and more ductility of the part 
but some of the some of the material can flow outward and then forms flash. So if you take a look at these steps of uh, steps in impression die forging, you see we have the blank or the work piece the, in blue that's put in between two dies and that are shaped dies and of course the forces are applied to close the dies and shape the part but you see you see that flash is forming right because some material will flow uh, outward like the shown here so this part is flash that needs to be trimmed and removed if you actually look from uh, the in another di direction inside the cavity what is going on is in, in image E you can see that flash is flowing out of the uh, die cavity okay so here you are seeing in this uh, eye beam type of shape we are seeing this part is called rib and this middle part is called web. These corners, these are the fillets. And these are the corners of it. And these are the flash, as you can see. And this is the parting line separating the uh, upper and lower die. So how this blank is created at the first place, right? There are different ways you can create a blank. Either extrusion, some powder metallurgy techniques, or you can do casting to prepare the blank. And then this blank is placed on the lower die and the upper die descends. And you shape it and the flash forms. Then the flash is trimmed off basically but there is an importance to this flash as you can see the flash is moving through a very tiny uh, cross section right so this creates a lot of friction remember uh, when you increase the contact area if there are there are thin regions in your die cavities the viscosity is lowering because the heat is transferred more quickly therefore there is a lot of resistance to flow uh, in the region of the flash so therefore due to this flash is resisting to flow uh, and the flow always happen uh, uh, in the direction of least resistance then because of the flash forming there the material is actually will flow preferentially into the die cavity uh, and eventually filling it completely rather than trying to uh, flow outside and form the flash so it actually has a positive effect here okay preferentially making the metal flow into the die cavity Well, instead of being made as one piece, the forging dies may be made from two or more pieces. As you can see in this image, they can have die inserts. So this is upper die block here and lower die block. And here's the work piece and some inserts were put in to shape the part. And the inserts can easily be replaced in the case of wear or failure in a particular region of the die. It is more difficult, of course, to replace the whole die, but it is easier to replace the inserts. And they are usually made of stronger and harder wear resistant materials compared to dyes. So there are preforming operations. These are done to enhance the distribution 
of the material into various regions of the blank. So what are these operations? The first one is Fullering. This is the material is distributed away from a dye region. You can see here and you can see the material is distributed away from the dye region and there is edging and in edging it is gathered into a localized region right so the part is formed into a rough shape by a process called blocking and where the blocking dyes are being used. Here you see you have the blank. You do edging. And with the edging, you are gathering the part into a localized region. And then you do blocking. Okay. With the blocking, uh, there is this rough shape that is forming using the blocker dies and you see the formation of flash Flash at the end is of course removed by trimming So as you can de de see these are stages in forging it is not like you do a forging once and you form the part it doesn't work that way there are stages you do preforming first like fullering edging and then uh, you do blocking and finishing and at the end do trimming to remove the flash Here it is illustrated how this trimming of the flash is done from a forged part. So there is this uh, 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 there is this flash right there, and you use trimming die. So you do punch in this direction, right? This will cut this part away, and it's gonna be the scrap now. It's it's removed from the part. This inner region is though, it is called slack. Okay, so that's the thin material at the center, which is removed by punching also. Okay, next is uh, one of the impression dye uh forging process is here closed die forging and in this one there is no flash formed so this is also called therefore flashless die forging that means uh the workpiece completely fills the die cavity and no extra material no flash has formed in true closed die forging the flash doesn't form but there are cases it can form but in true one in true closed die forging we don't expect the flash to form and we expect the workpiece to completely fill the die cavity so if you take a look at the figures to understand that you see in image A, a closed die forging with a flash. In image B, we are seeing a closed die forging without uh, the formation of flash. This is more like precision or flashless forging. 
to be able to achieve that you need to accurately control the blank volume and you need to accurately design the die so there are undersized blanks if you put undersized blanks that means you prevent the complete filling of the die cavity but if you have oversized blanks so you need to find this optimum size right if there's they are oversized that will generate excessive pressures into the die in the die because you need to apply more pressure and the dies might fail prematurely in precision forging as the name implies uh, the forged products have net shape forming so the form part is very close to their final dimensions this of course will reduce the additional finishing operations and typical parts uh, that are um, formed with this technique are gears connecting rods and turbine blades of course this uh, technique will require uh, special and more complex dies and it is very important to precisely control the blanks volume and shape it is also important to be able to accurately position the blank into the die cavity if you have parts that have fine details it will require higher 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 forces and usually this technique is suitable for aluminum and magnesium alloys because they will require low forging loads and uh, forging temperatures and there are cases steels and titanium can be also shaped with precision forging A type of forging operation is coining. This is actually a closed die forging process where it is used in the minting of coins, medallions and jewelry. So as you can see the blank is coined in a completely closed die cavity uh, process. This will create fine details. The pressures required can be as high as five or six times of the strength of the material. Here you cannot use lubricants because they can be entrapped in the die cavities. If these lubricants trapped in the die cavities, then uh, since the uh, lubricants are incompressible that will prevent the full reproduction of the fine surface detail and surface finish with this coining technique of course marking parts with letters and numbers for identification can also be done rapidly Heading is which is also called upset forging. It's an upsetting operation formed on the end of a rod or wire in order to increase its cross section. This is for uh, nails, bolt heads, screws, rivets, and fasteners. It can be carried out any temperature cold warm or hot and the images are given to us for this process the heading operations are performed on machines that called headers they are highly automated as you can see in the image with the use of a punch die and a blank the head is formed in the punch or head can be formed in the die as you see number two and three for nails and rivets piercing is a process of indenting 
the surface of the workpiece with a punch in order to produce a cavity. The workpiece can be confined in a container like you see in the image here or maybe unconstrained like you see in the images here. So piercing can also be followed by punching to produce a hole in the part. The piercing force depends on the cross-sectional area and the tip geometry of the punch and the strength of the workpiece and the friction at the punch and workpiece interfaces. And the pressure may range from three to five times the strength of the material. Hubbing is a process consists of pressing a hardened punch now with a specific tip uh, geometry like you are seeing here and this is pressing it into a, the surface of a block of metal this cavity produced is then subsequently used as a die for forming operations so therefore this hubbing technique is used to make dies for further forging operations there is isothermal forging which is also known as hot die forging in this process the dies are heated to the same temperature as that of the workpiece. Because the workpiece remains hot, its flow and ductility are maintained during the formation. Thus, the forging load is low, and the material flow within the die cavity is improved. Therefore, complex parts with uh, good dimensional accuracy can be obtained. The dyes here usually are made of nickel and molybdenum alloys because of their resistance to high temperatures. The process is expensive on the other hand, but the production rate is low. So let's talk about forgeability of metals. Forgeability is defined as the capability of a material to undergo deformation in forging without cracking. So how do we determine the forgeability of metals? There is two type of tests that has been developed over the years and one of this is the upsetting test. In the upsetting test you have a cylindrical specimen which is upset between flat dies um, to a reduction in height at which the cracks on the barrel surfaces will begin to develop. And so in conclusion the greater the deformation prior to cracking the greater the forgeability of metal. The second test is hot twist test. In again, there is a round specimen which is twisted continuously in the same direction until it fails. So the greater the number of complete turns that each specimen undergoes before failure, the greater the forgeability of the material. In this table, we are given the uh, forgeability of metals in decreasing order. So magnesium alloys uh, 
and aluminum alloys are the best ones as you can see and tungsten alloys seems to be the worst ones to leave with the least forgeability what about the forging defense of course it with um, the other techniques similar to the other techniques in the forging we also observe defects one of them is surface cracking and other ones are uh, formation of laps so as you remember when we are doing the forging the web may buckle as you see here in the image a the web can buckle this part remember is called uh, web and it will develop laps in the finished forging uh, product because these laps are basically uh, a form if there is an insufficient volume of material to completely fill the die cavity and in image B we are seeing if the web is too thick uh, if that is the case then the material uh, flows past the already formed portions of the forging and this can uh, create cracks Internal defects may also form if there is non-uniform deformation of the material in the die cavity. If there are temperature gradients developed throughout the workpiece. And if there are phase transformations happening. This will cause of course changes in the properties uh, throughout, right? Microstructural changes can be induced by phase transformations forging defects such as laps and cracks these can cause fatigue failures corrosion and wear during the service life of the forging it is very important to do inspection before using the part When designing a die, what should we careful about when it comes to forging? So these things you need to take into consideration. The shape and the complexity of the workpiece. Forgeability of the metal. Strength and its sensitivity to deformation rate. Temperature and frictional characteristics at the die workpiece interface and die distortion under forging loads so always the most important information that you need to keep in mind that the material will flow preferentially in the direction of least resistance so before actually the forging process is uh, realized there are softwares that have been used to si simulate basically the flow characteristics of the workpiece uh, under the application of uh, die forces uh, in forging so this way we can uh, analyze using a software and doing a simulation we can predict the flow of the metal and we can predict even the structure and the mechanical properties of the material by doing simulations. So pre-shaping uh, is done. Uh, the material should not flow easily into the flash. Uh, because uh, this will 
help the dye to fill in a complete way and the green flow pattern should be favorable for the strength and reliability of the part made and the sliding of the dye workpiece interface should be minimized in order to reduce dye wear so what are the dye features one is flash we seen and the gutter this region here Where is it? This part, right? The gutter. And then we seen. Where is it? We seen flash gutter, and uh, the parting line is where it is uh, a single plane at the center of the forging. Flash is uh, excess material that is allowed to flow into a gutter. Draft angles, those are necessary uh, in all forging dies in order to facilitate the removal of the forging. And selection of the proper corner and fillet ready is also important to ensure smooth flow of the metal into the die cavity. Small radii is not desirable because of the adverse effects on metal flow and their tendency to cause rapid die wear because this is due to stress concentration. And Small uh, fillet radii can also cause fatigue cracking of the dyes. And in general rule, you can say the radii should be as large as possible, uh, which is made possible by the design. And land is this region that is connecting the uh, work piece to the uh, gutter so there usually the length of the length is usually two or five times of the flash thickness so this is the software program called deform and it predicts the flow of the metal in forging and also predicts the microstructure and mechanical properties. So for dye materials, what we require is, of course, strength and toughness at elevated temperatures. And we want hardenability and ability to be hardened uniformly. Uniformly, we want resistance to mechanical and thermal shock. We want wear resistance, uh, especially to abrasive wear, and because the, there will be hard scale that will be present on the surfaces of hot forgings. So the material should be. Uh, we have high wear resistance. So common dye materials are tool and dye steels. These contain chromium, nickel, molybdenum, and vanadium. So of course lubrication is necessary, we talked about, because it reduces the wear and friction. Uh, because the friction is reduced, it will also redu reduce or affect the forging forces required and it will affect the flow of the metal to, into the cam ca cavities. They will also act as thermal barriers, so it, uh, the, which will slow the rate of cooling 
uh, this way it will uh, reduce the friction too and this will also act as a parting agent which makes it easier for us to be able to remove the part from the dye and uh, there are examples to these lubricants one is graphite, glass, molybdenum disulfide there are different types of forging machines with all of them will have different uh, capacities and one of them is hydraulic presses hydraulic presses they operate at constant speeds and they are load limited meaning the press stops if the load required exceeds its capacity it takes longer than in other types of forging machines so uh, this will of course really result in the material to cool down rapidly and compared to other mechanical presses, hydraulic presses are slower and involve initial high costs, but they require less maintenance. And the capacity range is between 4,000 tons and 82,000 tons. And another type of press is uh, mechanical presses. So, these presses have high production rates and they require less operating skills. The range is in between 1300 to 12,000 tons. A knuckle joint mechanical press that is shown right in here. Here in image D you see a hydraulic press. In image B we are seeing a knuckle joint uh, press. Because of this linkage uh, design, very high forces can be applied. Also, uh, screw presses. These presses derive their energy from a flywheel. Here. The forging load is transmitted through a large vertical screw and the ram comes to a stop when the flying wheel energy has been dissipated. Drop hammers. In this process, the ram's downstroke is accelerated by steam, air or hydraulic pressure. In counter blow hammers, these two hammers, uh, these hammers have two rams that simultaneously approach to each other. This can happen horizontally or vertically to forge the part. So in this table we are seeing typical speed ranges for forging equipment. Dye failures can result from uh, the following causes. So improper dye design, such as sharp corners or abrupt changes in cross sections, and we talked about these, or use of defective 
materials in uh, in this uh, selection of dye material or overheating or this is due to the cycling uh, temperature cycling of the dyes which can cause cracking overloading of course the use of excessive force on the dye and residual stresses which can cause sudden failures, cracking of the dye. In conclusion, we have seen the forging process and what type of forging processes exist, like open dye forging, closed dye forging. We have learned that uh, this operation is uh, happen through the application of compressive forces on the workpiece and in this operation we can use we can do it at room temperature or higher temperatures and defects can form several defects can form in the forging and we need to be careful about the dye design and there are different type of forging machines available to us. These are usually highly automated. If you watch the videos, you're going to see they are controlled by computers. And we need to be careful about choosing the right dye materials uh, for forging. And because the dye failure will, of course, affect the economics of the operation. So we need to choose the right materials and do the right dye design to pre prevent further failures. That's all we have learned. So next we're going to learn about extrusion.